I'm John Batchelor. John Hemingway's new book is In Full Flight, the story of Dr. Anne Spurry, born Swiss-French, extremely well-to-do, extremely well-educated, captured and tortured and abused by the Hitlerites and then identifies with the aggressor and becomes a monster to herself, then redeems herself. Her father helps her flee Europe, post-war Europe. It's now the 1990s. She is failing. She can no longer fly by herself. She has an assistant to help her. She has assistants at home because she's not really capable. What, cataracts? She's deaf. She's had a hip replaced. Um, and uh, her knees are gone, yes. And she's got narcolepsy when she flies. So all these dangerous things. But she just continues. She wants to fly forever. 97 to 99 are the critical periods. But I'm going to come to the... where This would be where the string music comes up if it's a film noir. She, get, she hears that her, her brother has collapsed with a stroke. Yes. And she must, fly to Niro she must fly from Nairobi to Paris. Francois, the elder of the family. Uh, even though she's in no condition to travel, she does it anyway. And she arrives at Francois's bedside. He's dying of a stroke. Uh, he's on life support. She holds his hand. Francois knows everything, doesn't he? Everything. Yeah. And... <clears throat> Uh, th this is not the way she had imagined it. Uh, she had always expected that she would, that he would outlive her. Uh, that was would be just fine, but it's not the way it's going right now. Then it would be the burden would be on him. Uh, the burden would be on him to cover it up, which right. she knew was was absolutely perfect because uh, I believe Francois would have burnt the evidence. Everything was available to him. Sure, all the money made yeah. the possessions come home. Sure, and it would be just fine uh, because she couldn't get rid of it for some reason, but he could. And so it doesn't happen that way. It's the beginning of the year, 1999, January. January, yes. And, um, uh, and, it, and there's no, he's lost, uh, you know, his, uh, his, his brain um, uh, meter is just flatlining right now. And uh, she knows that that's it. As a doctor, she knows. She calls her members of the family, and she gets permission, and they remove Francois from uh, life support. Uh, and he's dead within a few hours. Francois knows everything. She knows now. Destroy everything, or she doesn't. She chooses not to, right. including the master's thesis that's arrived from Heidelberg about Moray, where in there are secrets. You've talked to the physicians who saw her and in Blockhouse 10. Uh, Lecoq, Laporce, I mean, these are magnificent human beings, but they want to find a way to deal with who she is. Do they? No, uh, they don't. Uh, but they are uh, just, uh, they, they have this terrible um, uh, period of their lives when they see one article after another about Anne right. uh, treating her as a uh, modern day heroine. And they know the whole time. And, and, and they're looking at this thing of this woman that they, who they saw do the most unspeakable things in Block 10. And they hold their tongue. But my friend, I would like to call her my friend Louise Laporte's Actually, is this the one with the martini at noon? No, no, that's, no, that's Odette. Yes, Odette. Odette. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. She's absolutely wonderful. I just spoke to her, her son the other day. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Odette. Uh, yeah, but, but Louise yes. uh, was this wonderful woman who I met four times uh, in Bordeaux. And, uh, and she, uh, she had a file on Anne. Mm. She actually, well, the most extraordinary thing is she actually had the Christmas card that Carmen Morey and and Oh, the one they sent. They, yes, they gave Christmas it to 44. Her in Ravensbrook, right. 44, correct. Um, and she kept it somehow. How you keep these things uh, as you are uh, liberated out of Ravensbrook, I don't know how you keep any belongings, but Anne had done these cartoons on it and wishing her a Merry Christmas and um, snowman and wonderful things. Um, she kept them because she, she found it so surreal as 800 people were dying a day all around them. And then she kept all the material about Anne being this heroine. 
and um, and she just shook her head. She never wrote her. She never. Never. They never. I can understand that. Um, and her brother's dead. She goes back to her paradise. Right. And uh, she celebrates as much as she can. She likes champagne. She likes caviar. Yeah. She eats a whole lot of caviar. And the next morning does not get up or does not come calling for her house guest because she's had a stroke at the mirror. Yeah. Right. Same stroke her brother had. Exactly. Right. Same part of the brain, it closes yeah. down. One month so before. she's dying now, and they're going to have to make a decision to turn her off. However, the house is full of notes. She's never destroyed it. The old house in Alcol, is that how you say uh, it? Well, Alcolau, but uh, the, in Sabukia was the place. Sabukia has, yeah, Sabukia it's has got the a note. huge safe. Right. Everything's available, but she doesn't make a move to destroy it. No. All right. Other people are going to have to make that decision for her because after her death, they have people stand in line to come to, to say goodbye to her. Uh, you begin the book with the funeral. But the mystery you leave us, John, the notes are there. She wanted us to know, or she didn't. It's, it's as if, well, here's how I read it. And you, you know that I was a novelist. There are ghosts. And she lived with them. Yeah. And Maury was one of them. Yeah. I don't think a day passed when she didn't think about Carmen Maury, yeah. who was this uh, witch, but also this, this um, um, kind of seductress. That last letter that Carmen Mori wrote, you quoted length in the book. It, it, it is full, stunning. I... Carmen knows she's going to kill herself when she writes that letter. Yeah. Stunning. She keeps forgiving. Little Anne, she calls her. Yeah. I believe, I believe in, I don't know, the word romance is wrong here. What is it? Uh, well, I, I think it's oppression, too. Um, but she was, she... Uh, she has this wonderful way of mixing love uh, with guilt. And um, I think maybe we all relate to that in some way. Oh, oh but, but Carmen, I've never seen anything as good as, as bad as Carmen. I... Oh, I mean, she is uh, absolutely the queen of the art in this thing here. And her, and her use of language is so provocative and so real even to this day. Um, I couldn't edit one word out of it. I agree with you. And if, if the devil were to write a farewell, it would read like that. It <laughs> would try to involve us in the crime. Yeah. And, and her sense of fatalism, you know, she's not going to fight. We know that she cuts her own wrists, but she's, she dies in a pool of blood, but she's surrounded with her possessions. What was her motto? Do whatever you can get away with? Do whatever you can get away with. And uh, Dr. Anshbury today in Africa. You have this book. Do they want to listen? Do they want to know? I, I'm, I'm afraid there are a lot of people in Africa who are going to be very offended by this book because they do not want their saint, the pedestal of their saint, knocked down. And um, they believe that I'm a traitor to that friendship with her. I believe uh, that I would have been a traitor to that friendship if I hadn't told the real story. John Hemingway. The book is In Full Flight, A Story of Africa and Atonement. The story of Dr. Anshbury, Rest in Peace. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. <laughs>